All right, I'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Mitchell O'Neill, and I work for the New York Natural Heritage Program, uh, the IMAP Invasives team. So this is the New York IMAP Invasives monthly webinar, and today's topic is getting started with the Certified Trainers Network. Our speakers are myself, and we also have Emma Antolos, a public participation specialist with the DEC and a master trainer for the IMAP Certified Trainers Network. And you all can introduce yourselves in the chat box. I have some prompts listed on the right side of the slide. And I believe all of you are muted, um, and I would recommend that we stay that way during the presentation. Um, you can enter any questions or comments into the chat box. We have Meg Wilkinson in the chat box uh, monitoring for questions, and there will also be some time at the end for questions, and there's also an option to unmute yourself and ask them verbally when we get to that point. Thank you all for coming, and I will start with some background. So we are in the New York Natural Heritage Program. Our mission is to facilitate conservation of New York's biodiversity by providing comprehensive information and scientific expertise on rare species and natural ecosystems to resource managers and other conservation partners. We're a partnership between DEC and SUNY ESF. And since invasive species pose a threat to biodiversity, uh, we also have the Invasive Species Database Program within the National Heritage Program. And we're probably most well known for IMAP invasives, but we also manage the app for boat stewards during the summer. And we provide spatial prioritization models to help invasive species managers prioritize where to focus efforts. Just so we're all on the same page, invasive species are species of plants, animals, insects, and pathogens that are both non-native and they are negatively impactful. So they have some sort of harm to the environment, the economy, or human health. For example, I have a picture of hemlock woolly adelgid damage. Um, this is an insect from Asia that lives on and kills hemlock trees. So that's a great concern for our forest resources. You can see the sort of grayed out trees And so there's been a lot of research and theory looking into um, what invasion looks like across space and time, and also how can we best manage these invasive species and all of the problems they can cause. And so it turns out that how we best manage an invasive, invasive species depends on where it is in this invasion curve. So if it's not here yet, we would focus on prevention. If it's here, but in very small clumps, then maybe we could still eradicate it. Um, if it's widespread in some regions, but not others, we would want to contain it in the regions it is in now and not let it spread into other regions and so forth. So in order to strategize how we deal with invasive species, we really need data on their current distribution. For instance, here is a distribution map of hemlock woolly adelgid by topo quad. Um, so, in the north of the state, we would be focusing on prevention. In the south of the state, it would be more like on uh, long term management. And with the state as a whole, the priority would be containment, so not letting it spread from the areas where it is into the areas where it is not. And so, to fill these sorts of needs, um, the Invasive Species Database Program with the Natural Heritage Program runs IMAP Invasives for New York State. IMAP Invasives is a centralized invasive species database. Um, it's used by several jurisdictions across North America. In New York, we use it to support PRISMs, state agencies, and other partners working on invasive species issues. It can be used to uh, track species distributions and reports, early detection alerts, web map services, and for tracking control efforts and results. 
And I just mentioned PRISMS. So what that stands for is Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. And New York is uh, divided into eight of those regions have them spelled out on the left. So you can sort of see on the map where you might fall. Um, and after the call, you can Google your PRISM and it's a great idea to jump onto their listserv so that you can stay up to date on information about invasive species in your area. So the IMAP, the IMAP invasive database has a lot of data in it, but where does it come from? A lot of it comes from uploads of existing data from partner organizations, and those offer great snapshots of what the distribution of an invasive species is at that time, but distributions are always changing, so we need continuing uh, data uploads, and we really rely on people like you, so data entered by community scientists and professionals. This is really important because um, here at IMAP, we are the database people, we don't go out and do the surveying. So we manage the data that you guys collect. And just to uh, maintain the quality of the database, um, all species IDs are confirmed by experts. And so with this great, with this reliance on um, community science, we discovered that the IMAP team in Albany cannot provide all of the trainings across New York State. So there's a greater need for training to use the IMAP uh, resources than we have ourselves. So we've been very fortunate to develop this certified trainers network. So it's a train the trainer program that connects trainers with those who need training. It was established in 2017 by Brittany Rogers. She was a SUNY ESF student at the time, but now she works for the Slilo Prism. And we've been very lucky to have over 100 trainings and over 1,000 people trained since it was started. So that is why the CTN has been great for us, but we also think there are benefits to you for becoming a certified trainer. So one, I think everyone in the, on this call is interested in protecting natural resources in New York State. So being part of the Certified Trainers Network is a great way to contribute to ongoing, ongoing data collection to support invasive species work in New York State. It's also a great way for you to engage volunteers in the general public, it can be good experience on a resume. Um, you get to collaborate with trainers all across the state and you get access to resources on our website for your training. And so with that background, I'll go into what we're gonna to cover today. So our today's agenda is divided into two parts. First, I'm going to do an IMAP training where you, I teach you all how to set up your account, set up your mobile app and uh, submit records. Um, I did send out a handout to people who had registered ahead of time this morning. Uh, so you might have gotten a handout that will help walk you through this. So I will be going through this kind of quickly. So if you need help, enter into the chat box and there's also resources to help get everything sorted out after the webinar. And then the second part of the training is the details for actually delivering an IMAP training. So how do you join the Certified Trainers Network? And how do you actually deliver these in-person trainings? And I'd like to first make the distinction between the, well, I should review that. I'm, I'm, right now I'm gonna start with the IMAP invasive training. And before I do that, I want to make the distinction between the online web application and the mobile app. So the whole database exists on the web. You can view the data, uh, export data, all sorts of other things on the web application. So you get to that through your browser, either on your computer or your phone. And then the mobile app is separate and it is designed for simple, quick data collection in the field uh, for presence and not detect points. So I'm going to start with account setup, which is done on the online web application. And we recommend using Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, or Safari. 
So the first thing you do is go to nyimapinvasives.org. This is our website, and there are a lot of resources on it. But for logging into uh, IMAP, you go to the right and click Login or Create Account. They go to the same place. Um, you guys can follow along if some of you don't have your account yet. You can do that on your phone or your computer. And so when you click that Login or Create Account button, it brings you to this page on imapinvasives.natureserve.org. So you use the top if you already have an account. So this is the login bar. You'll put in your email and password. And if you haven't signed in for a while, you might have to reset your account by clicking Forgot Password. And if you don't have an account, you use this big sign up box on the bottom. So you'll put in all of your information and select New York for your jurisdiction. And once you hit join, it will send an email to the email you listed. And that's where you'll, there'll be a link to the user agreement, which you can read. And once you accept it, then you can go to log in. And just remember that once you've created the account, you log in at the login bar and you don't use the box anymore. So once you log in, it'll look something like this. There's always a pop-up for new releases. We had some updates just a few days ago. So if you're interested, you can click on the links they offer. And once you're all caught up, you can X out. This brings you to the main map. And I'll briefly go over where you can find everything on the website. So it's organized into the main menu on the top left, the navigation tools on the left side, the action tools at the top. So this is where you can filter for species. Um, you can export data. You can export lists of species by county or other ge geographies. And then on the right side, is where you control the geographic layers. So you can change your base maps. You can choose whether you want to be looking at present species or not detected species or treatments. And there's also some other more advanced features for geographic layers in there as well that you can play around with. And so I'm going to start with the main menu. So click the main menu on the top left with the little leaf, and that will bring up some options and you'll select your account. So this is how you finish setting up your account. Uh, this brings you to your user page, which has your information on the top and organizations and projects at the bottom. And the way you make changes is with this edit, edit button. So for a lot of you, the organizations and projects may be empty. So I'll explain what those are. Organizations are a way to group data for an organization. Um, and we generally recommend that these are for staff only. So for instance, if you are collecting invasive species data for the PRISM because you work for that PRISM, then you would want to join the organization. Um, so for some of you who are not officially affiliated with any sort of organization and are volunteering on your own, you don't need to join an organization in most cases. Um, and then so projects are another way to group data. Um, and this is what's often used for people who are volunteering for an organization, but not necessarily officially working for the organization. For instance, a PRISM might start a water chestnut uh, survey challenge and volunteers can tag this project on their um, record, but they don't have to join the organization for the PRISM. This is good for mapping efforts across organizations. So to join an organization, if that's applicable to you, you click that edit on the top right, scroll down to the organization box and click request to join organization. That button only pops up if you click edit. And then you can type in your organization and request to join. And make sure you scroll back up to where the edit button was and click save. And then this organization will appear on your account. You'll be a pending member first. And then once the admin from the organization accepts you, then you will be a member of the organization. 
and then you can tag your records with this organization. And one more feature of account setup would be email alerts. So these were set up so that state officials could be alerted to certain species in certain areas. But really everyone can use these to stay informed on the species and areas that they're interested in. For example, I live within the capital region prism and I'm interested in HWA. So I have a alert set up and it alerts me whenever there's a new uh, observation in the area. So that's a good way to stay up to date on the distribution. And so that's also on that main menu at the top left, right under your account, there's an option for your email alert. So you click there. And if you click the add edit alerts button on your email alert page, you'll see some general alerts that you can opt in or out of, and you can also add custom alerts. So this is where you can filter it down to the species you're interested in or the location you're interested in and a couple more advanced options. And so that was what I wanted to go over for online uh, account setup. If you have any questions, feel free to type those into the chat box. And th that at this point, we will switch over to setting up the mobile app so that now you have your account, you will be able to go out and survey for invasive species using the mobile app. So at this point, I will turn it over to Emma Antolis. Hey, Mitchell, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. All right. Hey, everyone. This is Emma Antolis. I am a public participation specialist for DEC. Um, some of you may know me. I was formerly the Invasive Species Education Outreach Coordinator. Um, but today I'm going to go quickly over the mobile app. Um, very easy to use. I love it. Um, they recently redid it, so I'm very happy with the functionality. Um, so first off, um, if you guys don't have, haven't done so already, um, you can download the app from Google Play or iOS App Store. Um, all you have to do is search for IMAP Invasives. So you can follow along as I go through this. Um, okay, thanks, Mitchell. Um, so with the mobile app, um, I liked Mitchell put this together. Um, it's kind of like a sandwich, okay? So these are the different parts um, of the sandwich that you need Wi-Fi and the other parts that don't. So you need Wi-Fi and connectivity um, when you're setting up your account and your app. But once you're out in the field and you're recording invasive species with the app, you know, making observations, you don't necessarily need to have Wi-Fi. Um, but once you're done collecting that data and you want to upload, upload it to the database, you're going to need um, Wi-Fi again. So you'll need the Wi-Fi to set up. Once you get out in the field, you don't need it, but then to upload those records into the database, you will need uh, Wi-Fi. All right, next slide. So we're going to first start off with um, setting up the app. Um, so now that you have it downloaded, um, what you want to do is go into that left-hand corner um, that looks like a, someone referred to it once as a hamburger. So you have those three little white lines, kind of looks like a hamburger. Um, and you're going to scroll down and you're going to click the preferences, preferences button. Um, so once you press that button, you're going to pull up and you'll see um, first up the jurisdiction species list. I presume most of you are in New York, so you want to choose New York. And then um, you want to plug in your username information, your email address that you had just set up on the IMAP website. Um, so for me, it would be emma.antolis at bec.ny.gov and put your password in. All right. And then um, okay, thanks. Um, you are going to want to press that retrieve IMAP list account and then um, once you do so, this little, little uh, pop-up box will come up and it will say your IMAP invasive data was retrieved successfully. Um, and you have to just make sure that um, your username and password matches to that IMAP online account. Um, so uh, sometimes the iPhones add extra space after the password. So if you're having some issues, try to, try to figure it out. Um, but once you um, get that correct, you should you know, be ready to go and save it. All right, so next slide. So some of these preferences are pretty basic. Um, I'm just gonna run through them. Um, so um, 
one of the first things here is species name. So um, you can choose whether you want the species listed as scientific species or common names. I like the common names. Sometimes I can't remember what the scientific names are. Um, so, you know, you can choose what you prefer. Um, and if you really are, you know, want to go out in the field and you want it to be quick, because if you have all the species listed, it's a long list. There's a lot of invasive species out there. Um, so what you can do, and I find this really helpful, you can customize the species list. So if you're, you know, want to go out on a trail and you're specifically looking for hemlock woolly adelgid and specifically looking for um, hemlock longate scale or very specific species, you can kind of make these short lists um, so you don't have to scroll looking for through all these species. And again, there are many of them. Um, so I highly recommend that, customizing your species list. Um, so if you want to, there's this great um, fake species um, that you can choose. So if you want to test, uh, you know, your app out, you can choose that fake species and try it out in the field. Um, I recommend that for any trainings. People always get a little nervous about submitting something that they think is actually, you know, going to, they're not, they're a little unsure of how it works. So I would choose that fake species to get them a little bit more comfortable with the functionality. Okay, next. Um, so picture quality, um, you know, we recommend 100% for best quality, um, and you could check that box there to save photos taken um, in the app to uh, your library, so if you want a backup, and usually you don't want to really need to mess around with these other um, defaults here, they're usually fine, so don't worry about those. Next slide, thanks. Um, so Mitchell just touched upon this a little bit about before. Um, after you join your organizations and projects on your Align account, you can add them as defaults here. So Mitchell mentioned the projects and organizations. You're not going to really need organizations unless you're a staff member. Um, you know, you might want to have a certain project. Um, you know, if say uh, the backcountry um, waters monitoring program up in APIP. You know, you might want to choose something like that if you're going out for a specific project purpose. Next, Mitchell. Oh, and then uh, this is the most important thing. Once you're done filling out all the information and your preferences, you want to make sure you press that save button. Um, very, very important. <laughs> And then, um, yeah, if you want to click that retrieve IMAP list. Um, okay. All right. Thanks, Mitchell. <laughs> All right, so again, um, you need to uh, do all those um, account preferences while you're connected to your Wi-Fi um, or data if you want to use your data on your phone or mobile device. Um, so next, when we're out in the field, we can record these invasive species. We do not need to be connected um, to data. We can, you know, just go on our merry way. All right, so now here comes the really fun part. Um, so when you're out in the field, um, you can start making observations. So you're back on your app and you see this um, big green rectangle here that says add observation. So what I'm gonna have you guys do if you're following along is press that button there. Okay. Um, so you can take a photo with your camera. So if you're out in the field, say you want to uh, look, if you see Hemlock Willie Adelgid, um, you can use the app and just take your photo right then and there by taking that take photo use camera button. Or if you had something, um, you had took a photo already, you can actually select that photo from the library. Um, again, this is where the species, cust customized species list comes in handy. Um, so if you know, you have this short list of species that you know you're going to be running into, and you know you want to search for, um, you want to press that button so it makes it easier to scroll through the millions of invasive species out there. Um, so if you guys want, again, want to play along at home, you can uh, select the species as fake species, um, you know, if you want to try to input this data. Um, this might be, again, helpful for you to play along with just to get the feel of the app. And then if you are detecting the species, you want to say species detected. So if you're seeing it there, yes, it's there, press that button. 
Um, or if you're not seeing it, then this is really important data too. Say, again, you're looking for hemlock woolly adelgid and you're inspecting these hemlocks, you can say, okay, I didn't find this species, so I'm going to say it's not detected. And that data is just as important as, you know, as the uh, detected data. We want to know where the species are and where they're not. Okay, next. All right, so if you scroll down a little bit, you'll start seeing, um, you know, a map of where you are. So hopefully that should um, come up. So your location should be right there. It should be using your GPS. So if you look at that location, the latitude and longitude, um, it should um, pop up with some specific numbers. But if it is displaying zero, zero, you need to make sure your GPS is enabled on your device. That's always um, an issue with a lot of folks that their settings aren't, um, you know, you know, you're not enabling your GPS. So play around with your phone if you're getting that zero, zero displaying. Okay, next. Again, here's, if, if you are interested, if you want, you know, to display your organization, you would choose it there. Or if you want a project, you can choose that quickly. Um, but again, some of that might not apply to you. Um, only if you want to be listed, you know, uh, with a certain project or if you have, uh, if you're employed by PRISM or, you know, a different state organization, et cetera. Next. Um, and then this is really important too. Um, it's, I think it's optional. Um, you can write how long you search for this invasive species. So, you know, that data is also important. So if you've just spent five minutes looking for hemlock woolly adelgid, you know, that is very different than if you search for, you know, an hour. So, you know, thoroughness is definitely something, you know, we kind of want to look for. So if you do want to, you can include that time searched. And then you can write anything in that comments box about what you saw, you know, um, maybe little notes. Uh, so, for instance, if you're out in the field and you were searching for hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, you noted that uh, there was treatments happening. Okay, so, uh, you know, if you're in Thatcher Park and um, someone from Park actually treated the tree, maybe you can write that in the notes there. Or any observations, you know, was uh, what time of uh, day it was or what, uh, what the weather was like, anything that you might feel might be useful. Okay, next. And most importantly, don't forget to save your changes. Um, so really, really important when you're taking photos, make sure they're good. So as you see, the photos of hemlock woolly adelgid on the left, not so great. They're kind of fuzzy. Um, you know, it's hard for our um, folks who will be, uh, you know, confirming the presence of these species, it's hard for them to be able to tell what that is. Um, so make sure um, you're, you know, getting really close and clear. Sometimes uh, your phone has that autofocus function, so make sure you're focusing on the species um, itself, not the background. Um, and uh, a really good hint is to put a piece of paper behind it or put a hand, um, you know, with the species. So if you have hemlock woolly adelgid and you don't have a piece of paper, you could just lay it on your hand. Um, I always like to put a, um, some sort of scale in there too. So if you have like a coin um, that you have to, to lay it next to it, um, it helps. Because sometimes photos are kind of hard to figure out when they're out of context. Um, so having that sort of scale object is really helpful. Next. Um, and lastly, um, we're going to upload those records to IMAP. So again, this requires connectivity. So you need to be on Wi-Fi to do this. So you're going to have these little uh, uh, yellow um, uh, rectangles once you press save. Um, and you can edit that with that little pencil icon there um, that's circled if you want to change anything um, on there. Um, and I think, Mitchell, do you have anything? Additional. Okay, and then um, if you want to upload that, so if you have your um, common read observation, you can click that little box, that little check mark box, um, and upload it. So you're going to have to click that check mark box and then go back to that hamburger, that uh, three yellow lines in the left hand corner, and press upload selected. And then that is when it will be uh, submitted into the database. And it will ask you, are you sure you want to upload this? and you say, yes, okay, I want to upload this. 
And then um, if you don't have any of those yellow rectangle, yellow cards, thank you, Meg, <laughs> um, then you're good to go. All your observations are uploaded. So if you're seeing those yellow cards, you have data on your phone, you're just not uploaded. So record is on your device if you have those yellow cards and it's not online. And then once you click that little check mark box and you submit it, you're good to go. It's left the phone, it's in the online database. All right, and I think that's it for me. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Mitchell. And yeah, you guys can enter questions into the chat box if you have any. Uh, one thing I'll also mention here is that at my first training, I remember my card was red and I was very confused why mine was red and everyone else's was yellow. So that happens when you forget to select the species. So I just went back in with the edit tool, the little pencil, and selected my species and then my card was yellow and I was able to upload it. And so at this point in the training, it's oftentimes fun to go from the mobile app back into the online application so we can see all of the fake species that were just submitted. Um, for the sake of time today, I'm going to encourage that as an after webinar assignment. So you can go into uh, IMAP Invasive, and you can play around with some of the action tools. So there's the filter tool, which you could use to filter on uh, fake species records, and you would see um, that, unlike this morning when the map was blank, uh, there will be some populated points all across the state for where you guys entered fake species records. Um, there's also the identify measure tool that you can use to draw a polygon around a couple of points and get a table that will allow you to click on specific records to view more details. Um, and you can also export data using the export slash report button. Um, that slash report is new, so now you can also actually um, export lists. That's what the report is. Um, it's report species list by geography. And then in the uh, add distribution layer bar on the uh, geographic layers uh, rectangle on the right side of the screen, you can make a distribution map. So you could um, have the counties shaded in for wherever a certain invasive species is detected, or you could do uh, topo squares like I did in my HWA example or even water bodies. And so, yeah, you guys can do that after the webinar if you're interested and remember to use Google Chrome, Firefox, or Safari. And since we just went over a lot of material, I want to make sure you know where to find help resources. So we have our website, newyorkimapinvasive.org. We are recording to past webinars. Um, this one will go up there once I upload that. Um, there's online help docs and tutorials. Um, there's some invasive species guides or links to invasive species guides. And you can also email me at imapinvasive at dec.my.gov. And then the IMAP Invasive Network, so several states and a Canadian province, we have a IMAP Invasive's website as well. So it's imapinvasive.org slash help is where you can find some more resources. And with that, we've gone over um, the IMAP Invasive training and we can shift on to how certified trainers can become certified and how they can deliver these trainings themselves. So it's a three-step process to become a certified trainer. Everyone listening to me right now is completing the first step, which is attending an initial IMAP CTN training. So you've all, you all have that all set. And then the second step is submitting a certification plan. So that can be found at New York IMAP Invasive slash Certified Trainers Network. You can also use the main menu, go to, to trainings and then Certified Trainers Network. And that's where you'll find that form. And that's basically just your contact information, why are you interested in the CTN and um, you can enter details for your first training if you've planned that and your intended audience and stuff like that. 
And then step three would be to implement the plan. So that's when you actually do the trainings. And once you've done your first training, you're a certified trainer. And to do trainings and for us to be able to keep track of this and uh, keep track of certifications, we really need you to fill out two forms. So there's a pre-training form and a post-training form, or we call it the follow-up form. So the pre-training form just has a couple of details, um, like the date and the audience. Um, and the follow-up form has some more information that you'll only know after you've done the training, like how many people attended. Um, that might sound like a lot of forms, but I promise you they're all very short. So I put on trainings all the time. I have to fill all these out too. So I made sure that it's just the information we need from you and it's not something that's going to take up too much of your time. So once you do uh, your training and you submit your follow-up form, we'll know that it actually happened and then you'll be a basic trainer. So you'll need one training to become a basic trainer and to keep that going, you need to do one training per year. If you do a lot of trainings, you may become a master trainer. So that happens when you've done three trainings and to maintain that, you have to do two a year. And for after your first training, I just want to add that you don't need to be the leader for every training for it to count. We also count it if you are assisting at trainings, but we do want you to have to be the lead for a training to get your initial certification. And for us to keep track of this, again, we need the pre-training details form. Um, that includes a checkbox for if you want us to advertise it on our website, in which case you would have to just enter in a couple more details, like uh, how people can register, stuff like that. And then again, the follow-up training details form, which is very brief, just a couple of details for us to track how the trainings went. And I've tried to keep everything pretty easy to access. So I have a little snapshot of our website and that is all right at the top right of our uh, certified trainers page so that you can find everything you need to get certified and then some of the quick training resources you need to put on a training. And so one of the resources is the uh, IMAP Invasive Training Checklist. And that divides things up into before, during and after. So most of the work goes into the prep work. Um, but we try to make it as streamlined as possible so that you don't have to do everything from scratch. You can use what we've already done to sort of uh, make your preparation easier. Um, a lot of this is thinking about in-person trainings because typically that's what we are more focused on. Um, right now, webinars are the way we are engaging with people most of the time. So I'm also going to add a slide about some webinar tips to sort of think about delivering IMAP and basic training that way. And one thing that'll come up a couple of times is that we really feel that training with a partner has a lot of benefits. Oftentimes that's a presenter and then an assistant who does tech support, or you can switch off presenting different topics. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So for the training, uh, some things you want to do way ahead of time, maybe a month or more if possible, is you have to plan the time, place, and format. And so when thinking about that, you have to uh, plan out who are you trying to reach? Will you need internet connection to do what you're trying to do? Like um, get people set up on IMAP accounts? Um, do you want to do an outdoor portion? like a guided hike um, is in person the way to go or a webinar and it's also an option to try to coordinate with someone to have another uh, like part another related presentation for instance a biologist could jump in after you and talk about um, species identification for some key species in the area and so coordinating with a training partner, that's something you want to start planning out um, a month ahead of time, getting your training partner and planning out what roles you both want to play. Um, so then you have to submit the training class details form. That's how we know that training is going to happen and we can put it on our website for you if you want more advertisement of it. 
We also generally recommend that you set up a pre-registration. Um, sometimes that doesn't apply. It's up to you. It's just something that we think is often good so that you have an idea of who's going to be attending the training. And if you have questions about that and can't figure out how to do that, you can email me at imapinvasive at dec.ny.gov. And you might also want to think about advertising. So in some cases, you might just be delivering a training to some group that is having its meeting, in which case that organization will probably handle advertising and you don't have to think about that. But if you are putting this on yourself, you might want to think about um, how can you advertise, like sending it uh, to listservs, social media. Um, if you check our box, um, it'll be advertised on um, our website. If you check the box on the training class details form, um, and you might also want to talk to your prism. And then, so that's stuff you want to get moving ahead of time and then closer to the training, you'll want to be finishing up the PowerPoint. So we have a PowerPoint on the uh, IMF Invasive Certified Trainers Network website that you can work from. Right now it's from our past training. Um, I'll upload this or parts of this uh, webinar that you're viewing right now as well for you to use um, so that you can sort of just take the material and adapt it rather than having to create everything from scratch if you don't want to do that. Um, you'll want to download any training documents and practice IMAP to make sure you're, it's fresh in your mind and you'll know how to answer questions as best as you can. Uh, sometimes a good thing to do is a reminder email. So up to two or three days before, um, you can also remind the day of. It's really up to you. Um, and one thing to do in that email is to encourage users to create their accounts before training. So that sort of lessens the amount of technical issues that your group will have at the beginning of your meeting and sort of allow you to focus on more of the advanced uh, data collection stuff. And we have a pre-training handout that walks through uh, creating your account, joining organizations and projects if needed, and setting up your mobile app so that you're uh, more prepared for the training and can practice observing and creating records. And one additional tip for uh, delivering a presentation is it's often good to try to tailor to your audience. Um, so my PowerPoint today has sort of framed around Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Um, that's uh, really great in some parts of the state. In other parts of the state, there might be other species that are of more concern. Um, for instance, in the southern tier, you might be, uh, Tree of Heaven might be a good thing that you could use. So you could replace my examples with Tree of Heaven and make a distribution map for that using IMAP. Um, if it's a presentation for a lake association or something more aquatic focused, you could choose an aquatic species like water chestnut, and I have a a distribution map of which water bodies have water chestnut records. One thing that you might also be interested in, um, so a lot of you have invasive species identification experience. Um, some of you might not have as much. The one thing to get you more, more comfortable with that is our 10 common terrestrial invasive species flashcards so that shows you uh, pictures and how to identify some of the most common terrestrial invasive plant species. So those are ones that you're very likely to find and um, they'd be good resources for people you train as well because these are plants they will actually be able to find and report into IMAP. So that's the prep work. During the training, you want to make sure to collect attendance it's often done with a sign-in sheet. Uh, make sure you silence your phone and close unnecessary computer programs. Um, if you're planning on doing a live demo of the site, make sure you open your web browser and get to those pages ahead of time because it can be very slow and uh, kind of slow the presentation down if you're waiting for things to load. 
Um, and so during the presentation is where your training partner comes in handy. So one of you can be presenting and the other person can be going around to help people who are having specific issues with their phones or their accounts so that you can keep the presentation moving smoothly. And make sure to answer and co collect questions. Um, ones that you can't answer, uh, make sure you collect those so that you can follow up with them. Uh, you can always contact me with these types of questions if you don't know how to answer them. Um, and then it's also a good idea to encourage feedback on the training via an evaluation form. I'll talk a little bit more about that next slide. Um, another thing to think about is a lot of the time uh, we'll train all these volunteers, they'll be very excited, they'll get all set up on IMAP, learn about invasive species, um, but then life happens and they're busy and they don't really get to the point where they're recording species um, in their free time. Um, so one thing to try to keep that, there, you might want to think about how to keep up that momentum that they build during the training. So you could uh, come up with goals for them, like how about everybody submits an observation by the end of the week or a certain number each month? Um, or you could make a list of some areas or species that you want them to target specifically to kind of hone in their efforts. So after the training, um, we really need that post-training details form to know that the training happened and to keep you certified. And you can also send us attendance, but that is optional. Um, another good thing to do in some cases is a personalized thank you email to the attendees. Um, you can include the goals that you set for them there to keep them engaged. And also we have made this evaluation form. So it's just a quick, I think seven question form that people can fill out that describes um, how comfortable they are with IMAP now, how did the training go, and this is just so that we can uh, collect these responses and figure out if there's ways we can improve our training in the future. Um, and then it's always good to review your notes and reflect on what went well and what could go better as you prepare for your next training. And so with webinars, there's a couple more things to consider. So I'm just going to briefly discuss those here. So you'll need to think about um, how are you gonna host this webinar? So do you have a webinar software with a host account or do you need to find a partner who does? Um, we at IMAP can uh, host webinars, um, which you probably noticed because that's what I'm doing right now. But you can contact me if you want me to co-host so that you are able to host one as well. Um, and training partners are still very useful in the webinar world because you need someone to practice with ahead of time so that you can make sure your audio is good enough, make sure the screen sharing works and you know how to mute and unmute yourself. And um, you need to work out how the multiple presenter situation is, work, is gonna work. Um, so I just advanced slides for Emma today because to me, that's simpler than trying to switch uh, switch the presenter in the software because that sometimes gets complicated. And it's always very useful to have a non-presenter in the chat box. So if I had the chat box open right now, I would be very distracted. So I'm very thankful that we have Meg Wilkinson monitoring the chat box to answer any questions or to collect questions to talk about later. And while you can't uh, hand out paper copies of anything at a webinar, you can still email PDF. And then I just also thought through some other tips, like today I started two minutes late, uh, recognizing that some people might have issues getting into the webinar. Um, I avoid Monday mornings because those are high traffic times and the webinars are very glitchy. Um, make sure you have backups for any live demos. Um, be aware that troubleshooting you might have to do after the webinar because you can't go and help someone on their phone like you can in person. Um, and just know that some of your attendees might not be familiar with webinar software, so be ready to help them. Um, I was on a webinar last week uh, with the Adirondack Prism and they had this cool slide at the beginning that showed you where all of the tools were so you would know how to get to the chat box, how to mute yourself, um, and all of that kind of stuff.
and just make sure you can find everything I've talked about. So on nyimapinvasive.org, um, navigate to the Certified Trainers Network. It's under the Training tab of the main menu, and it brings you to this main page. And on the top right are all of your click links, quick links. So um, how to find all the forms to become a trainer, and then some of the resources for putting on a training, like the checklist, the PowerPoint you use, um, handout, and the training evaluation form. And then you can scroll down and there's more resources on the page. For instance, a map of certified trainers. Um, once you're a certified trainer, your name shows up on the list. And so one thing we've been thinking about is how does the Certified Trainers Network collaborate? So we have all of these trainers across New York State um, who know how to train people on IMAP Invasive. Right now I have a list of emails and everyone on the CTN has my email. So if anyone's ever looking for a training, they want a training partner, they have a question about their training, they email me and then I can address it or send it out to the Certified Trainers Network. And we've been wondering if there might be a way to better collaborate. So one idea might be a Facebook group that could be used as a discussion forum so that you guys can post stuff out to the network yourself. Um, but we're open to other ideas. So I'm going to ask you in the chat box to say whether you would use Facebook, like a Facebook group, or if you have any other ideas, because we're very curious. Um, Mitchell. I am monitoring the Facebook and just FYI, that question did already come up before you got to it in the presentation. And I did mention the Facebook idea and there is uh, at least one person saying they would be able to use a Facebook group. Cool. Good to know. Thank you. And so I've talked about um, in-person trainings and webinars, another way for promoting IMAP and engaging with volunteers and the general public would be social media. Um, for, existence, for example, I posted on Instagram um, some pictures of me surveying for Hemlock Woolly Adelgid and sort of uh, introducing IMAP invasives as a social distancing activity. Um, if you are interested in posting about IMAP invasives, I think that would be a great way to engage with volunteers and the general public. Um, we use uh, those three hashtags I've listed and you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook at NYIMAP invasive. Um, and just one thing to note is that New York State does have recommendations on recreation and social distancing. So things like staying local, staying home if you feel sick, and avoiding crowds. And I'll just mention that I went over the IMAP mobile app today. That's kind of the quick and easy app. Um, if anyone you're training uh, has some more advanced needs, just be aware that we do have some more advanced tools um, and you can direct them to me for that. And at that point, I think we're ready for questions. So I think there might be some questions lined up in the chat box. Um, you can also unmute yourself to ask a question if you prefer to do it that way. And I just wanna make sure on our slide, you can see um, my email if you wanna contact me later, the website if you want to uh, get some more information. And we also have some more webinars coming up that are listed on the right side. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, and special thank you to Emma for giving us an awesome mobile app training on short notice. And any questions? Mitchell, um, I'm gonna jump in with one uh, tip and um, then we should loop back to the Facebook or other connection opportunities that has been flying. I think all the other questions mm -hmm. that came in were minor. Um, Someone did ask about the GPS in a low connectivity area. Um, and one suggestion, I, I asked John real quick and he said to uncheck the GPS box can sometimes help. Waiting can help sometimes, you know, that GPS accuracy is there and um, 
when that number gets low, if you uncheck the box, it stops trying but holds what it has. Um, so that's another possibility. Um, do you have anything you want to add to the GPS or you want me to share my tip? Uh, that tip sounded good. Do you have another tip? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> when we get back into um, in person world, um, I you mentioned the training and having a partner to assist. I think that's invaluable. Another partner angle that we have found works very well over the years. Um, we have found at most IMAP trainings, unless you're doing a training for college students or something like that, um, most of our general IMAP trainings at a club or a parks event or something like that, there tends to be a very wide range of tech savviness. And one mm -hmm. thing that we have found works well is you can ask, you know, for people who successfully uploaded the fake species record as a test um, to raise their hands and then ask them to work with someone who hasn't been able to do that. And when you do that pairing, it is good to keep in mind, try to put an iPhone person with an iPhone person and an Android person with an Android person. Um, but that one-on-one -on -one pairing has worked really well. It's a way for the people attending the training to um, you know, connect with someone new. And it's very helpful for us because if there's a number of tech challenged people, there's no way even two of you can get to all of them. Yeah, that's a great idea. I am trying to open up the chat to see comments on the Facebook group. So were there any other ideas? Someone suggested Facebook LinkedIn. Like mm -hmm. Oh, there's a great question there. Just the new one about how to get it to be a how to get your group added to IMAP as a organization. Yeah, so you can email me. So there's that IMAP invasives at dec.my.gov and then I will create the organization. So I would just need to know what you want the title to be and who you want to be as an admin. And then at that point, the admin will be able to accept people into the group or the organization. And then Mitchell, the next one I will take. Um, that is a great question and thank you for bringing it up, Eric. <laughs> um, that is embarrassing and I don't want Mitchell to have to feel that. <laughs> so uh, we started over a year ago working on getting certificates and um, for basic trainers and I think t-shirts for master trainers. And I know that they've never been sent out. So. You know, the first thing was it turned out that was challenging with our contract and ESF and da da da. And then Brittany got her job, and we had no one filling in behind her until Mitchell started in January. And then it was on our list in January, Mitchell, I remember. <laughs> but, you know, now with COVID 19, yeah. ordering t shirts just hasn't made it to the top. So um, it is definitely our intention. And thank you for asking. And, um, we will, um, we will add it to our <laughs> short list. Um, it'd be nice to get them to people um, before field season. Yep, yep. So it is two o'clock, so some of you might have to hop onto another webinar. So I just want to say thank you all for joining, um, but I can stay on. So if there's more questions or we wanna talk more about the collaboration Facebook group topic, I am happy to do that too. It looks like Facebook might be the way to go. Um, a lot of people have that. Yeah, and that, that would be, that would work well for us because we do have a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, we have not embarked on LinkedIn. <laughs> Mm -hmm. cool. I 
I really appreciate all you guys attending and I really love the stuff you put in the chat box about how you're planning to use IMAP. So as you move forward, um, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions or um, need help planning or designing or connecting or any of that. So Juliana, uh, your question about what it would be called, um, it would be called something like uh, New York IMAP and Basis Certified Trainers Network, but I will, I have everyone um, who registered for this webinar, I have your emails and anyone else on the Certified Trainers Network, I have a list of your emails. So I will send out to send, once I create a Facebook page for us to collaborate on, I will send that information out. And with that, thank you for joining everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you, Mitchell. Free feel, feel free to email me. Great job, Mitchell. Thank you.